made by Buckhorn Plastics. Anyone seen these before? Yeah, so they're not very common around here. I, one of these things that I like was like, it's got to be something where I can lift up and get the grain to come out. And I first started using a, the water tanks and I would cut a hole in it and made my own like chute and I would fill it up and then lift it above the thing and climb on top of it and then open the door and like stuff the and grain And then one out. day I saw him, like he used to also use the sling bags from like Vermont Quality Compost. And so then we'd have the feed company blow into those. And then I was like watching him with the, the big forklift and the skid steer and then like going underneath this big, huge one ton bag to like untie it and like all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that system fails once and I don't have a husband anymore. So it was like, you've got to like do something else with how you are like handling the grain. So, I mean, it's pretty scary. Accidents happen, and I was just like looking at this whole system, and I'm like, no, no, no. So then he found found these. Yeah. So these great. are um, two pieces. Uh, you can find them on Amazon, but you know they're very expensive now. I think they're over a thousand dollars each. They're two pieces, um, but it's called a gravity flow bin, and so the the, the inside is tapered, and then there's a shoot um, handle on the other side, and so you lift it up, and so you have to have a tractor that can lift a ton. And so we, our tractor can hold, you know, 3,500 pounds. So I can carry this and drive it down the road a few miles and then lift it up above those red one-ton things, pull that handle, and then in 10 seconds, it's all emptied into the, um, the one-ton silo. So these are like really flexible if you get in tight spaces. When we wanted to put a pig feeder in the woods, we can drive in the woods and get feed in there. Um, they're totally waterproof. The lid keeps water out, vermin out, no mice. They're great. We own three of them. Um, and then these, again, we get um, at, uh, down at uh, Organic Gem in New Bedford. These are made for the industry. They're two-inch insulated tubs, very expensive new, 600 bucks each. But we get them for free. You bring them some pies and sweet corn in the summer. And if they are damaged or dinged, the industry can't use them anymore. And so we you know, get them for free. And they're, those are great for putting feed in in the field. They have tops on them, too, so they're waterproof and um, they hold about 600 pounds of grain, and they're great. You can put them in the field, you can reach down into them, scoop stuff out. They're really great in the winter for holding water for layers, or we have our rabbit system, water system, using this because it's really insulated. You can put water in there from a well, and with no heat element in there at all, because it's so insulated, it really doesn't freeze for a long time. Um, and we, this is, and these were awesome from when we did our own chicken processing. So we just buy food grade bag liner for these totes and then we basically as we're processing put a layer in, layer of ice, layer of chicken, layer of ice and those birds got down below 40 degrees in like an hour and then stayed there and like you know we could keep, we could go get the ice, the delivery the day before on a 90 degree day and have them in these totes and then the next morning start processing and it's like not even started to defrost yet so. Other feeding stuff, uh, we go through a tons of grit. The chickens eat a lot of grit and the layers eat a lot of oyster shells. If your birds are eating a lot of forage, they need a lot of grit. Oh. And we give it to them free choice. They're out there. And then um, again, they're, they're basically screwed down and bolting down on the, yeah, the, the corner, corner there, braces. There's a little uh, a gutter. We just fill that every day. The Freedom Ranger, the red broilers eat a tremendous amount of grit. Per bird, uh, I don't know, per batch of birds, we probably go through three ba 150 pounds sometimes. Okay. When we were processing our own birds, you know, you cut open that gizzard and it was just <laughs> so much grit in there. I, think, I can't remember how many of batches we did. 500 birds, so you can do the math, yeah. So, um, you know, this is always the big question about when can you go from bagged feed to bulk feed? And that is like huge money savings. So. We were very excited when we finally got to a scale to be able to stop buying 50 pound bags of organic grain and going to bulk. But where we are, you know, three ton minimum to come and deliver that, we can mix and match the grain with that three ton minimum so we can get some broiler grain, some layer grain, some pig grain if we want. So that's a way to scale into it if they'll mix the batch for you when they deliver. Um, now we're at the scale where we're doing it. So I just threw some stuff in a spreadsheet to try to figure out the calculation of where kind of nirvana is and you really also don't want to store your grain for more than you need to so we try to just keep grain on hand for a month at a time especially you know during the growing season you don't want it to let it sit around and get rancid during the winter you could probably push that out a lot longer but if we're constantly getting fresh grain every month that's kind of our target 
So um, this is just for layers, not for broilers, but just doing some math here. I don't know what you guys are paying for organic grain in a 50 pound bag. Anyone? 28? Okay. So we figure and we're paying about 750 a ton for bulk organic grains. So really you want to keep stuff on hand for about 30 days. Um, you need around 800 layers to do that um, if you're just kind of doing a general calculation that way. And then just trying to show what you can save in a year time of you know, bumping up from bag to organic, you can save almost $13,000. So, so when you think feeders or you know, silos are expensive, it pays back really fast. Oh. Yeah, and then, you know, again, but then the opposite of that is like, okay, if you have an 800 bird flock, so you can get to be buying in bulk, can you sell that many eggs? <laughs> and so just do it, you know, kind of following that through and then um, trying to also figure out what your percentage of your cost of the eggs is, is for feed and you're trying to target you know, 17 to less than 30 percent. Yeah, I mean, right? your feed cost should definitely be less than 30 percent um, overall. So yeah, happy to send a spreadsheet, but those are just, there's a lot of great information in the publication that Maggie mentioned. All right, electric fencing, poultry netting, special, it's graduated so that the bottom yeah, is smaller. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're not perfect by any means, so, you know, but the, really the ideal is to keep that fence above 3,000 volts all the time. You know, make sure it's taut like it is there. You know, they really talk about using corner braces to make sure you're really um, rigid at the end. Uh, Premier now has a million type of fences, uh, Premier One out of the Midwest, where the uprights are, you know, eight feet apart, 12 feet apart. They have cheaper fences and more expensive fences. 50 foot fences, 100 foot fences, you know, they used to have 164 foot fences. You know, you see the sag there, you know, Fox, no problem. Um, you get, go back one, you know, you get, the longer you have these fences, they say seven or eight years, you know, you run over them with the car, stuff gets caught in them, they get torn, you know, you can repair them for so long, but each time you repair them, there's that much more um, loss of, of charge going through the fence. So it's definitely a big maintenance item, but you can't do what we're doing without it. Any questions on solar electric fencing? We always have extra car batteries, swap them out use a fence charger, test it, keep it clean. Yep. All right, so, all right, a lot of environmental factors out there. Um, light, sun, temperature, all the weather, mud, dust, toxins they can come into contact with, and predators. <laughs> yeah, big chicken. a big chicken, our sun. So this was, you know, that's actually not a picture of, of our field, but that's one of my project's <laughs> fields, um, and it does that every year. So it's certainly something to think about where you're raising your birds. This was kind of inside our greenhouse uh, flooded. that flooded. Yeah, so just keeping all things, those things in, in check. And then these are all of our predators issues that we've dealt with over the years. Um, Owls, that we got a nice video of an owl from the game camera just eating away at the same, in the same spot of the bird. And, you know, you can start to learn over time what the carnage looks like and what they do, what each species will do something slightly different. And then you can help identify what predator it is that's eating your birds and hopefully do something against it. This year we were outsmarted by the fox um, and one of our fields, our early fields that we move our layers to. And, you can tell the story of this is the neighbor's house right there um, that's at the edge of the field and was calling us at four in the morning saying the fox is eating your hens so he kept adding more single strand around the outside of the poultry netting and keep charging it and then she'd still call it four in the morning we hear the fox yelping louder because they're still getting through your barricades so after you know losing about 30 or 40 birds we're like okay i guess we'll move them off that field because people were seeing foxes running around in broad daylight, which they hadn't seen in like 10 years. So, um, and this was a recent one. You can tell that fun story. So we've never really had a lot of fox pressure until this last year. You know, we lost about 50 birds over two days in that other field and we ended up, you know, we put two separate charges out there. We had double strand electric outside the fence with about 8,000 volts in it. Mm -hmm. And the fox was still getting shocked, but it was not stopping. And so we ended up leaving that field this picture on the left, bottom left, was taken this week. We had a, we've been losing some birds and I put a camera out, I couldn't find it. Saw the tracks through the snow. I went out one early morning and I looked inside our makeshift hide tunnel and the fox was inside where the birds were staying warm, you know, eating a bird. Saw me, I ran out, 
um, jump, I saw it jump, 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 jump over our fence. I said, okay, a fence is not high enough, obviously. And then uh, it disappeared. About 10 minutes later, another kid who works on the farm walked up the farm road holding the fox around his neck. I was like, oh my God, how the heck? Did and he said, my dog cornered it in the barn, bit my dog on the face. I pried its jaws off my dog's nose. And then I grabbed it by the neck. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe you killed it. He's like, I'm not sure it's dead. And he threw it down on the floor. And it was like, ha, ah, and it started to like get back up. And then he grabbed it again. And then I grabbed it. I said, what do I have? I grabbed a ranch and I hit it over the head. So. It was heavy but mangy, it had eremites, and he was getting it tested for rabies, we don't know. But this is a, a smaller weasel that doesn't eat birds but sucks their blood. And very typical in this one field we had for a, a while, we'd move the feeder rangers out, and about a week later, they would, at that, loved them that size. And it killed every bird in that one coop. Dug in like that, the coop was down to the ground, didn't rip the wire, nothing. And it usually does that or takes them and piles them all the way up into a corner. A very neat little weasel. Um, and so that's a fisher cat we caught that was killing a bunch of birds and I caught it in a have a heart trap. Uh, it's just, you know, it's tough. We lost three years ago. Brand new birds, just moving out the pasture. Look at their feet. Nice bright orange. They just started to lay. And we lost about 75 birds to a fisher cat in two days. And when that happens, talking about flexibility of fields, luckily we had fields. We were like, we just can't, we can't compete. So we just went out there and we took the birds away. We moved them to a different field. We just, you know, the only thing that'll stop that will be a dog or another livestock guardian animal. I mean, we had good fences, you know, electrified, great. But you know, those predators that are so aggressive, they'll dig, they'll jump. They know what they want, and it's really hard. Are they getting them in the daytime or at night? Those were at night. The fox was usually at dawn. So this is still more environmental. We, um, I was going to talk a little bit more about lighting, but we're probably going to run out of time. And there's a couple of really great articles out there. If you just Google poultry lighting, there's a lot of good work being done right now on LEDs and light spectrum stuff. Um, so I can pass these around if you want to write them. But Highline has a whole big thing um, in their production system about poultry lighting and there's another group that's doing a lot of LED work. People want to do that. But um, it's becoming something that it's really hard. A, it's really hard to control in a pasture-based system to get the right amount of lighting. So industry can manipulate this much better than a pasture producer can. But to the extent that they're in your brooder or you're raising up your, your laying hens from, from chicks, there's a lot of um, thought about lighting. So lighting is composed of wavelength, intensity, and duration. And this is how it's really interesting because there aren't even really light meters out there because we build them to assess light from a human perspective. But this is the um, comparison of chickens can see a much broader range of light than humans can. So they, and they respond very well. There was one article that was talking about how the chicken's optic nerve system and ocular stuff is almost the same size as its brain. So that tells you how important light is on their whole entire hormone development and reproductive process and growth process compared to their whole brain function. So there's a whole lot more about lighting that can really impact that. So the blue and the green areas and spectrum of light are really what promote growth. So in the industry, if you're raising all your meat birds in a barn, you really want to have more blue-green light. And then if you're raising layers and you want them to be reproducing and raising eggs, the, the orange-red light spectrum is, is important. And you can't really manipulate that very well with the incandescent and infrared stuff so that some of the LEDs now you can buy for the color spectrum so this is why some of these new companies are now really developing whole systems of poultry lighting that's really cool and we're going to start to look more into this and, and try to figure out how we can incorporate that into what we're doing in yeah, the brooder. One of, one of the companies said they did a study and that a, a, um, the brown egg layers over a season so if they're getting 300 eggs a year we'll get 330 eggs under optimal lighting condition, 10% increase in production, tremendous amount of money. Yeah. So these are all the different, um, different colors, red, blue, and then red, white, and blue mix, and how they um, impact bird behavior. So this stuff is in some of these articles, so if you look those up. And then again, this is, didn't all show up very well, but how the average um, eggs per hen per week 
are fluctuating based on the different intensity of, of the, the light and things like that. Yeah, we do already. We have solar panels and timers and a car battery inside our mobile coops for going into fall. Yeah, we have LEDs now, but you know we'll probably shift to making sure that we have the right spectrum of lights in there. Car battery or boat battery? A deep cycle battery. Okay. Marine battery. Yeah, marine battery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, the, basically a lot of the studies are showing the first three days, 20 to 23 hours of light. Darkness is important as well as having light, having some period of darkness. Again, you need to make sure the heat is correct. But and then basically 18 to 20 hours a day in the industry of the of meat bird light. So that's obviously not going to happen out in your mobile pasture pens unless you're going to be lighting your mobile meat bird coops. Um, and same for layers. Again, to keep a consistent level of production, they really need 16 hours a day year round. So if you're not lighting your birds in the fall, you're obviously going to lose production over that period of time, which again is when in our area demand is going up. So keeping a good lighting regime is really important. And it doesn't have to be a lot, like you know, putting the, the solar panel, the LED lights inside the coop is great. It just needs to be enough to be able to read a newspaper at your you know, arm's length le level. Is enough it's why light. meat birds in the middle of summer are much bigger than meat birds in the fall. And so you know, actually one of the things I think I want to do this year, which I don't know anyone who's doing, is put meat lights on meat birds in the pasture in the fall. You know, going into September, October, you're losing a lot of daylight. And a lot of people growing birds now, September, October, into early November, and with that decreasing daylight, you know, you're losing a ton of money. So it's not the heat, it's the daylight. So that's really important too, and it costs nothing. So this is again about um, being rigorous about culling and not culling. Um, if you are trying to have a production flock and you're starting to, if you're not really wanting to turn your birds over in just big batches like we talked about earlier, there are certain ways that you can look and try to assess whether you've got a performer or not a performer. So these are common charts out there, but basically if they look haggard and bleached and ragged and rugged, they're probably a really good layer. It means she's probably working, so they're taking a lot of nutrients from their body. If you see them molt and then come back in and their combs start to brighten up and their shanks start to put more color in, they're obviously not probably a good layer. And the best way to tell is to, to grab the bird and feel their pubic bones. You should be able to get at least three finger widths between her pubic bones. They should be nice and flexible. If they're stiff, if you can only get one or two fingers in the pubic bone area, then she's probably not laying. So a lot of different ways that you can assess whether your birds are laying. If you're going to even do it on a bird by bird basis. If you have a small enough flock, it can be worth it. Or if you have one that's questionable or seeing a drop in production. This is kind of an, a neat chart about how they bring back um, the color in the order that it leaves when they're laying or not laying. And then uh, molting. Uh, some people force a molt with their birds. Again, you can restrict food and water and manipulate light molt to bring them out of production and then bring them back into production. So some people um, do that. I don't know anybody that we know that does it, but um, it has been done. Some of the big production people do that. Chores. This is our egg washer. <laughs> This is something that is interesting. If you go on and Google YouTube the Happy Egg Washer, you can see our little hokey custom-made thing that's kept us going for the last three or four years, which has been great. It's a little tabletop thing. Uh, we may end up needing to go at some point to a more inline commercial egg washer. But really, our, our big goal is to keep the eggs clean from the very beginning so that we don't have to wash as many. So we heard from Joel, or somebody said at some point, if you're washing more than 20% of your eggs, your whole system is flawed. So try to keep them clean from, from the beginning. Um, and then just to say that you know, mobile processing and whatever, um, we think it's really great to invest in good equipment in terms of how you're going to transport the birds, um, you know, moving them at night, um, keeping them less stressed. We always do it in the darkness and crate them up at night. And then make sure that, again, we've restricted the feed but not the water so they can clear their gut out for processing. Your processor will be grateful if you do that. It makes it easier. And then we've used a mobile unit for many, many years. I'll just go through these really fast. It takes a lot of shape and form. This is my sh pride and joy, mm -hmm. raising money to get this second one built in Eastern Mass for us, um, enclosed. We built it after the Vermont model and learned a lot of lessons about what not to do. Even still, this is not perfect, but um, it's been working really well. 
Um, so there are a lot of advantages. Um, we loved it for a long time for a lot of different reasons, but less stress of the bird. We knew how they were treated, less biosecurity risk. We could control the process from start to finish. We knew exactly what happened to our birds. We could keep and economize all the parts. We sold the heads for, to the raw dog food people. We got all our feet. We did all of our giblets. You know, we tried to use as much of it. And again, the volunteer engagement piece, which drove customers and media attention, was huge. And it was less, more cost effective if we didn't account for the fact that we were using volunteers and not paying labor. And um, you know, we're not paying somebody five bucks a bird and driving all over the place, except to go get it. Disadvantages, it's not a traditional model. There's a lot of paperwork involved. It was expensive. We had to go get the unit, bring it there, set up all of our stuff every time, sanitize it, do all that stuff, sharing it. You never knew what was going to be wrong with it, um, all that good stuff. Um, a lot of different steps involved that, sorry, we ran out of time to go through. Um, but this is, was kind of our setup. So we had a nice old dairy silage pit area that we did it in. It was shady. It was cool. It was not visible to the public. And so we'd basically set up all of our crates and they'd go through the back end where the cones and the scalder and the plucker were and the other side was the clean area. And then because we kind of outgrew, because we had so many volunteers, because we were doing so many birds in one day, outgrew the space just inside. So we ended up getting approval from our public health folks to set up an outdoor evisceration station area. So we had to buy another hot water wash sink and have it under shelter and figure out our plot process flow so we weren't cross contaminating, but they did let us expand outside. So the birds go in the back through there. And then this is a small evisceration table on the inside. There's everything nice and clean and ready to go. There's a pass through, so the birds are coming out of the kill side right here, right into this table. And then we have set up two extra stations right back there. And then they go into this initial um, chill tanks there. We had another chill tank over here for if the eviscerators got backed up, we could just put them with their head and feet um, removed. We had all these giblet buckets, so these were on ice, so we've kept all the feet. And then we kept all the inside stuff. And then people were working outside as well. So it was a big circus. Um, and this was turkey day. So this is the outside table. So P Pete rigged up a nice little water system. So we had buckets to catch the water and the viscera underneath. And then we had little spray down um, things over the table under the tent. And, uh, and then we got to keep all your records, keep temperature checking, and make sure your compost and wastewater was all dealt with according to the state. And then we would, this is again, this, um, these insulated tubs, and we would just basically, I would do quality control, so I'd take all those buckets and I'd go through back through each bird and make sure people didn't leave in lungs or crops or you know, windpipes or didn't forgot to cut the vent off. Nobody wants a chicken with their butt on it still. So go through all that. They go in here, layer by layer, ice birds, ice birds. We fill that up, we put it on there, and then we'd go take lunch. So we'd do kill all the birds, put all the birds on ice, and then we'd go um, do lunch and come back and then weigh and bag and label. Um, so we had these little PVC racks, we'd drain them, we'd bag them. We have our pricing scale, our lovely volunteer who decided to, and we always kept track of all of our weights so we knew how our production was going, so we had good records. And, and we don't get that information back now that we'd send them to a processor of what our average is other than by price. And again, just having happy volunteers is important so they keep coming back. And then having a way now that, um, to store all of them, somebody asked about what our cooling situation was. So this is a handy little insulated refrigerator freezer trailer. So it can be refrigeration unit. We can set it to 36 or 38 degrees, whatever we want. And then we stack all the birds in meat trays. It'll be nicely stacked in there. If we're done with fresh distribution, we need to freeze everything, crank it down to zero. The birds freeze in place. They're nicely packaged so they're not all smushed with you know, everything being frozen in different wonky directions. Um, and then they can be frozen and, put, and transferred to chest freezers or however else we want to freeze them. Anything else you want to say about that? And then marketing, marketing, we already talked about that. Good. Got through it all. All right. Thank you. Um,